Okay, um, so welcome to the first of its kind um, UH Energy webinar uh, on uh, the electric vehicle uh, transition that is um, fast accelerating in Houston. Uh, and this is in partnership with Evolve Houston, uh, a, a consortium uh, that has uh, multiple companies, the city of Houston and the University of Houston as partners. Uh, and today, uh, I think we've, we couldn't have started with a better set of uh, speakers and topic uh, than what we have today. Uh, Dr. Beydoun and Dr. Islami from HARP, uh, good friends and also uh, great uh, experts in this area of looking at air quality. Their report on this topic has been an amazing uh, report that they put out a few months ago on how the Houston air quality has changed. Um, but before I go there, I want to thank uh, the Energy Coalition at the University of Houston, and specifically Andres Bryan, uh, who is a senior in biomedical engineering at the University of Houston, for their passion around uh, electric vehicles, the electric vehicle transition for the city of Houston, uh, and, and um, creating this webinar series. Um, Andreas is working on a senior design project uh, on urinary incontinence, and in his spare time, he thinks about electric vehicles. So, uh, so perfect uh, passion-related uh, re project. And with that, I want to start off, uh, hand it off to Andreas, and let him get get us started. Thank you, Dr. Kristen Morthy. Um, so, like he said, my name is Andreas Bryan, and today I'll be the moderator um, for the event. Um, so I want to thank um, our partner Evolve Houston again, we're, and we're so glad to have um, them working with UH Energy so we can start providing reliable alternatives for transportation. Uh, sorry. All right. So to learn more about any of the Evolve webinar series or the UH Energy related projects, please visit this link. Um, it'll have the upcoming webinars that we'll have soon throughout the whole year. And on top of that, you can go and see the different types of webinars that will be presented. So moving forward, we will have the uh, Q&A session at the very end of the presentation. So please hold on to your questions until the end. That being said, we will utilize the chat function. So when the time comes for the Q&A session, go ahead and submit your uh, questions in the chat box at the very bottom of your screen. And when they start coming in, I will be moderating them to Dr. Beydoun uh, so that we can have a more smooth transition. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Mustafa Beydoun and Dr. Abraham Esplami. So Dr. Beydoun holds a PhD in City and Regional Planning from the Ohio State University and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Florida. Before joining HARC in 2006, Dr. Beydoun served as a faculty member of the Urban Planning and, and Environmental Policy Program at Texas Southern University, as well as the graduate program in urban and regional planning at the University of Iowa. Dr. Beydoun has had a long history in researching urban development, renewable energy resources, and air quality due to vehicle emissions. Joining HARC in 2016, Dr. Beydoun became the Vice President and Chief, Chief Operating Officer, where he's responsible for administering and coordinating the operations of HARC's administrative goals. Dr. Islami, holds a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering, a Master's in Environmental Engineering, and a PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. In his doctoral research, Dr. Islami applied complex algorithms to address problems in atmospheric science, such as real-time air quality, weather forecasting, hurricane tracking, and air pollution-induced health impacts. Dr. Islami brings over 10 years of experience working on projects that include developing sustainable concrete materials from industrial byproducts, improving air quality models, and much more in the fields of civil and environmental engineering. At HARC, Dr. Islami is a postdoctoral research scientist specializing in air quality and sustainability. His current research interests include applications of machine learning in sustainability, health and cost impacts of air pollution, air quality modeling, and advanced environmental data analysis. So in the next couple of moments, we will be starting the video. So if you could please turn off your videos and audio, that would be much appreciated. And once again, the questions, um, if you submit them through the chat, I'll receive them, but they will be addressed at the very end.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending our webinar. We'll, today we'll be talking about the air quality impacts of COVID-19 on the Houston region and the, the United States. My name is Mustafa Beydoun. I'm the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the Houston Advanced Research Center, HARC. I'll be joined by Ibrahim Islami. He's a postdoc research scientist at HARC, and he leads a lot of our air quality work. This is a broad overview of the presentation. I'll, I'll give you just a few slides on HARC, what we do and who we are. I'll then discuss some of the mobility issues that we came across associated with COVID, especially during the first few weeks of the pandemic. Then take a look at some of the energy uses changes from last year compared to the COVID timeframe in March. And then Ibrahim will, 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 will uh, discuss what happened in terms of air quality uh, and the associated implications of those mobility and energy use changes that we discussed earlier. HARC is a sustainability nonprofit research organization. We were founded in 1982 by George Mitchell and we're headquartered up in the Woodlands. We primarily focus on clean energy, water management, uh, climate risk, and air quality issues. And uh, if this wasn't the pandemic and we were in our office, we'd be in this wonderful LEED Platinum uh, Net Zero building uh, up in the Woodlands. We're one of only about 50 uh, Net Zero office buildings in the whole country and the first and only such building here in, uh, in the state of Texas. Mobility obviously had a big impact on COVID with all the different orders that were uh, established, uh, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic. On March 11th, we had the World Health Organization uh, issue the warning on COVID uh, and President Trump suspending travel, uh, much of the international travel in and out of the U.S. On March 13, Governor Abbott issues a disaster proclamation in Texas. The Houston Independent School District closes and, 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 and these numbers basically are our data from, from cell phone usage, comparing 2019 with 2020 uh, travel numbers. And you can see the, the mark, the decline, um, especially associated with these different milestones. On March 20th, the Governor Abbott closes restaurants and dining rooms. So you see a very significant drop there. And, and it's significant across the various uh, eight counties that we looked at. This is uh, just focused on Harris County, once again, looking at these various uh, proclamations and, and, and orders in Harris uh, County from the governor and from the judge. And you can see there's quite a dramatic drop, once again, especially during that, those first three or four weeks of COVID. Uh, April, we, we see a st steady rise in the region. And then uh, when we get to May, we see movement that normalizes. Although there, there are some uh, blips here and there. And on May 18th, that's when Jim's and exercise facilities were allowed to partially reopen. Uh, Non-essential workforces were allowed to partially return as well. Then we saw on uh, May 22nd, uh, the restaurant capacity was expanded to 50%. So you saw a slight jump there. And, and uh, this looks at those transportation numbers, but basically in terms of weekly reductions uh, uh, in Harris County. And once again, you can see that the uh, Primary significant reductions are, are especially pronounced during the first three or four weeks of the COVID pandemic, where on, on weekends you saw 55, 53% reductions in travel, especially during that week of March 30th and, and um, April the 6th. This looks at the same data, but primarily focusing on non-essential trips in Harris County. And here it's extremely dramatic during those third and fourth and fifth weeks of of the pandemic where, where you see almost 70% reductions, uh, especially once again on weekends. But even during weekdays, you're talking 58, 64, and 62% respectively over those third, fourth, and fifth weeks of the pandemic. And this kind of highlights and, and displays that data uh, at the various county levels across the, uh, across the state. And you can see the most pronounced reductions are in Travis County, uh, which saw a, a essentially 40% reduction. Uh, during the, that first four-week four period of the pandemic from March 11th to April uh, 13th, 2020, as compared to that same time frame in, in 2019. Harris County had a 32% reduction, and the rest of the state kind of is, is, is similar, primarily in the 20s and 30s, although Webb County on the border uh, only had a 7% reduction. Energy use, as you can imagine, because people are traveling less, was also something that uh, we saw significant changes in when you compare March 2019 data, which is what we have here versus March 2020 data. Uh, this is uh, electric power consumption data from Centerpoint. It's at the zip code level. 
And uh, what you see is you had a significant uh, reduction in energy usage in 2020 versus 2019, uh, primarily in the, in the main commercial centers, primarily downtown, the Energy Corridor, Greenway Plaza, and the Galleria. And in many of these areas, we had 50-plus uh, percent reductions, uh, once again, uh, in 2020 versus 2019. And uh, conversely, a lot of these workers weren't working uh, at the office, but rather working from home. And suburban areas uh, saw, saw some dramatic increases in power consumption, uh, 30, 40 percent in some areas, but primarily averaging about 20, 25-plus percent. There was concern about whether the grid would be able to handle that increase in power uh, to these suburban areas, but, but, but for the most part, I think we weathered that storm fairly well. Uh, up in the woodlands, I think we hit close to about 30, 35 percent uh, increases in power consumption, and once again in 2020 versus 2019. The Texas Medical Center, we also saw dramatic reductions in power consumption there. Uh, hitting over 50% in March 2020 versus 50% uh, reductions in March 2020 versus March 2019. And that was primarily largely because of the fact that all non-essential uh, surgeries and, and medical visits were canceled as the medical center and that uh, medical complex started preparing for COVID-19. And even uh, uh, to our east in the industrial corridor, we saw similar reductions, uh, sometimes significant 40 to 50%. Uh, once again, uh, a lot of that was due to the uh, geopolitics and, and the price of oil uh, dramatically decreasing, but, but also to COVID restrictions and, and some other things. And, uh, and, and, and this aligns with some of the raw material throughput data that, that we were able to look at from the Energy Information Administration. So, so we saw what COVID did on the mobility side, dramatic reductions in, in Harris County in our region as a whole. Uh, a lot of us uh, ended up working from home once again, especially during those three first, th those first four, five, six weeks of the COVID pandemic. And and our real focus of the presentation is here on air quality. And here you see some very dramatic uh, reductions, uh, and reductions uh, uh, in terms of the concentration of pollutants in the air. So they're actually air quality improvements, of course. All this data is based on. Uh, ambient air quality monitoring data from various uh, regulatory monitors in our region and other parts of the state and, and across the country for that matter. What you see is that NOx reductions during that first four-week period dropped significantly uh, in, in the uh, Houston, Galveston, Brazoria metro area, down 46 percent. BTEX emissions, and, and Ibrahim will discuss all these things, all these things in more detail, were down 39 percent. Total VOCs were down 9 percent and ozone was down 17 um, percent. And, and this kind of gives you a glimmer of what a Houston might look like if we have a significant increase in the number of electric vehicles in our region, especially if those vehicles are running on clean uh, Houston solar or West Texas wind. Uh, you'll have a dramatic decrease in NOx uh, because those vehicles aren't emitting uh, fuel because they're not burning fuel, essentially. And, and, and same with many of these other pollutants, which, which uh, will result in, in, in a significant improvement in our ozone levels. You see, though, as we progress further away from the starting point of the COVID pandemic and closer to, 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 to mid-June, those reductions are, are slowly decreasing. Once again, those improvements are, are, are slowly decreasing. So uh, by, by that uh, second uh, three, four-week period, NOx reductions are down 18 percent rather than 46 percent. And by the time we get to that March through June 11th period, we're only down 14%. Uh, and by the time you get to, uh, to, to, to essentially uh, mid-late May, ozone reductions are almost gone. And by the time you get to early June, uh, ozone levels have actually increased. And Ibrahim will talk to this phenomenon a little bit. But, but, but essentially, given our photochemistry in the Houston region, significant reductions in NOx uh, uh, will, will decrease ozone levels. Small reductions in NOx will actually increase ozone levels. And he'll discuss the photochemistry, how ozone is a secondary pollutant, and, and why these things are important when we look at possible uh, ambient air quality policies with respect to vehicle electrification and, uh, and other things. Bon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Swan. I continue. Uh, we're discussing about the details of the air quality analysis during the COVID-19. And thank you, Mustafa, for covering the first point, mobility and energy side. 
And uh, uh, let me start with uh, before uh, going to uh, detail analysis uh, quality changes. I want to mention uh, metrological uh, difference uh, during the COVID-19 2020. Uh, we had a little bit stronger wind during the COVID-19, about 13 percent. Uh, so that actually uh, helps uh, the uh, pollutant to transport. That will be very important when they discuss about the PM2.5 in the region. And uh, we had a, a little bit warmer weather in, uh, in terms of the temperature. Uh, that's actually uh, yeah, leads to the more efficient uh, ozone chemistry. Uh, so that's actually the, uh, we can conclude that the initial impact of COVID-19 is even higher uh, than what we show here. So this is just, I just want to mention uh, before going to the data analysis. Uh, here's a comparison of the uh, NOx concentration uh, collected by the ambient air quality uh, operated by uh, TCQ, uh, Texas uh, TCQ, and uh, we selected uh, four different stations that are uh, geographically scattered across the uh, Harris County. Uh, so we have a station in, our, in the Ship Channel, we have a station in Abdine, the uh, main route, and the uh, Line Road and the Northwest Side County. Here you can see, here you can see two different uh, groups of time series, the one in the purple one and the, the, color, the other color. The purple doesn't change uh, the before and after COVID-19. The reason is that the, this particular station is located inside a, a green area, which uh, we call it the uh, background station. So the, uh, it's designed uh, uh, to be away from the emission sources. Uh, not emission sources, so that's why we we cannot see any measurable difference between uh, the, the max time series before and after the COVID-19. But the rest of the station, you can see the the significant decrease uh, after uh, the March 11, which uh, the uh, WHO uh, uh, characterized COVID-19 as a pandemic, and March 17, which I can see closely restaurant. And uh, uh, dining room and bar. Uh, this this supply shows uh, a better way to uh, shows better way to uh, this decrease. You can see that uh, in, in this plus uh, the blue lines are the historical trend uh, that we assume that the historical trend is the recent history of the air pollution. Uh, they meaning the, anything happened during the same period of time, March 11 to April, uh, April 13, the first few weeks of the COVID-19, uh, between 2014 and 2019. Uh, this will be the historical trend and the, the trend that we will uh, compare our uh, the, the, the air quality during the COVID-19. And the, uh, the red lines are the air, air quality during the COVID-19, the March 11 to April 13. And uh, this is the NO2 uh, collected by the uh, ambient air quality monitors, and this is the BTEX or BTEX uh, collected by the same uh, monitor. Uh, FYI, the BTEX uh, are uh, the combination of benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, and they are a very good footprint of uh, mobile sources and the traffic related uh, emission sources uh, within the region. And we are actually lucky that uh, we have a, a few stations that measure the uh, BTEX. Uh, yes. As you can see here, the, uh, we experience the significant reduction in uh, NO2 and BTEX uh, during the pandemic uh, due to the uh, significant reduction in the uh, traffic and mobility. And uh, this is the uh, com this plot compares the ozone concentration for the same period of time with the historical trend. And you can see that uh, even the ozone concentration, uh, the values decrease significantly during the pandemic. And I will discuss about uh, discuss about it later and compare it with the uh, the Texas level and the uh, national level as well. I just want to point out. Uh, this is an interesting phenomenon that you can see here uh, uh, between uh, what happened in ozone between Saturday and Sunday. In Saturday, we have a significant dip, uh, basically minimizes uh, throughout the week. Uh, but in Sunday, all of a sudden, the uh, value goes uh, uh, very high and it peaks uh, during the week. 
uh, this happens because the, the as in some formation in mobility, uh, and this is uh, during the weekend, uh, we saw even more uh, significant reduction in uh, traffic that leads uh, to even more decrease in uh, NOx emission. So decreasing in NOx emission results uh, among the uh, resulted amount of the ozone reduction by NOx titration, which leads to the uh, uh, plant increase in uh, ozone in Sunday. That actually it creates a lag for ozone to be created between the Saturday and Sunday. This actually usually happens uh, during the night, but because uh, we saw a very uh, significant decrease uh, during the weekend, it happens in uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday. And uh, we will see a similar trend uh, uh, we will see that similar trend in uh, other cities in, in Texas, uh, mostly. Uh, but the other uh, similarity of the metro areas uh, in, within the Texas state with Houston is that uh, all regions, all, all metro areas within the Texas state, uh, they experience a, a reduction in ozone concentration. Uh, for some of them, like Austin uh, uh, metro area, we saw even more reduction. And uh, for uh, others, like Paso, we saw a little bit smaller uh, uh, reduction in autumn. As Mustafa mentioned, Austin was uh, the county that has the highest uh, decrease in terms of mobility. So uh, that's likely uh, to be a uh, contribute to the significant uh, reduction in ozone concentration. And when we compare uh, the trend across uh, uh, different counties in uh, Texas, we also see the similar trend uh, to the Houston, uh, except for some uh, uh, for some uh, border countries like Web County and Orange County, which we saw even uh, increase in uh, ozone concentration. As I mentioned at the beginning of the quality uh, presentation, we, saw, uh, we, are, we were experiencing a little bit uh, uh, windier con condition uh, that, that uh, is likely to be uh, contributing here in increasing the ozone concentration because the ozone transport uh, uh, in, in the neighbor uh, uh, counties and coming from uh, the outside the state. And uh, these are the selected metro area across the nation. Uh, we have Chicago, Houston, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. And uh, here it can be seen that uh, across the nation also there is a significant decrease in ozone concentration. And uh, for some, uh, for some metro area, uh, such as San Francisco, this decrease was not uh, as, uh, as uh, large as uh, Los Angeles because uh, uh, the nature of the ozone uh, formation in San Francisco is different than uh, Houston or Los Angeles. And, uh, but uh, for all these metro area, we saw that uh, things can decrease during the first two weeks of uh, the COVID-19. And uh, here's the, the mobility data and the uh, the daily average uh, distance traveled and uh, compare uh, compare with the uh, ozone concentration changes during the COVID-19. Uh, as I mentioned, that the, the significant decrease in Austin uh, mobility uh, leads to even higher decrease in ozone concentration, and, and in in, uh, in, some, in the rest of the, the metro area that we discussed, the, the, the decrease in mobility was. Uh, similar except for in Paso, which uh, experienced the lowest decrease in uh, mobility, which also leads to the lowest uh, decrease in uh, ozone concentration. So there is a meaningful relationship between the uh, average uh, distance travel or mobility uh, to the reduction of the air quality uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, for PM, a little bit different story. Uh, so we saw actually a net increase in uh, PM2.5 uh, in the region, in uh, Houston, Galveston, uh, Houston, Woodland, Sugarland metro area. Uh, it is likely to be uh, due to the uh, more efficient uh, uh, pollution transport, transport because uh, uh, we had uh, windier condition uh, during the uh, COVID-19 time period, 
So that leads to even more efficient transport uh, of the pollutant coming, uh, coming uh, mostly coming out of the uh, uh, out of the state. Uh, 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 for example, due to the uh, wildfire uh, or uh, agricultural biomass burning in Mexico, uh, or the uh, dust event or mini dust event uh, that we had experienced during that time. Uh, the same trend. Basically, we saw uh, across the state, uh, the, mostly we saw the net, net increase uh, or no difference uh, in terms of the gentle fire uh, concentration. And compared with the historical level, uh, for a cancer, we saw actually the, the decrease uh, that was uh, uh, because we, we even saw even, uh, we saw uh, even more wind, so that uh, that higher wind the higher wind uh, washes out the uh, pluton into the pulsar probably towards the in, inside state. So the, 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 the so that's another evidence that uh, uh, that uh, net increase in the of fire comes from the source outside state. In uh, in a national wide study, uh, we saw a mix uh, of increase and decrease. Uh, 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 for example, in Los Angeles, we saw a significant decrease in uh, PM2.5 concentration. That is due to uh, the fact that the, the PM2.5 in Los Angeles coming out of the mobile vehicles, uh, source up in uh, uh, traffic. Uh, with traffic uh, decreased significantly, the PM2.5 decreased significantly along the as well. The same goes with the San Francisco and, and Washington, D.C. Uh, but uh, uh, Chicago and Houston, their uh, share uh, their PM25 the PM25 emissions, both of which uh, the, the PM25 emissions come from non-road uh, emissions, so it's, it's less related to the mobile sources. So that's why uh, it's most likely to be uh, transported from outside the uh, the, the region. And uh, this is actually uh, month by month uh, analysis of data uh, in the, across different states in the United States. Uh, in March, which uh, it was the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, you can see a significant decrease in all the concentration across the United States. Uh, we have a little bit increase here and there, but generally speaking, uh, almost all states uh, experience uh, significantly less ozone concentration compared with the same uh, period of time uh, after uh, 2014. And uh, we have Texas here, which has among the highest degrees in uh, uh, national wide. Uh, but as the time goes, uh, and the state uh, try to open its industry, and the gap started to uh, close down. You can see in Texas, uh, we are in so so state, so uh, we don't have any difference basically. But there's still uh, national wide, uh, we have uh, a decline in all the concentration compared to the historical level. In some states, also, uh, we, we think that even the gap is, it became even larger. Uh, for example, in Hawaii, which uh, almost all uh, air traffic uh, were gone. As it goes to the May, as uh, state uh, it actually opens it's most of the industries, uh, by that time, uh, we're seeing a spike in ozone concentration in Texas, uh, uh, as you can see here. But even though the, uh, in most states still the ozone concentration is below the historical level. And in June, uh, the, not even the gap closed completely. We are, we are, we're seeing even more uh, uh, spike in ozone concentration compared with the historical level in Texas. And this, uh, the increase in ozone concentration uh, expands to the, the most states across the United States. And still, for some stations, for some states, we're seeing the decline of ozone, like California, but mostly the ozone level is back to normal or even higher than before COVID-19 by June. Uh, this is a time series uh, 
that compares the historical level and uh, month by month uh, uh, with, two th with 2020. Uh, as you can see, this uh, here in the text, but as you can see, we saw the decline of the concentration in March, but the uh, value uh, quickly picked up, picked up in uh, May and June. And it became normalized after that. Uh, in uh, Central United States, the decline of ozone even uh, was even uh, more significant. More significant. It's uh, also likely to be a psychological impact or uh, because uh, the ozone background in this region coming out of the industrial region uh, uh, from Texas to the California the western side, the southern side, the western side. So that's why they're getting even less ozone background. So that's why the, the ozone concentration reduced even more. But you can see after June and July, everything is normalized across the United States. Even for Hawaii, it's trying to be normalized after some point. Uh, this is NO2 comparison. Uh, uh, you can see the significant decline in NO2 in the beginning of the pandemic in most states, even for Texas. But uh, even NO2 concentration are normalized after some point. I just want to point out that this is uh, not a complete plot because the EP is not QC, so uh, the end of the value after some point. So that's why it's not as complete as what you have in ozone concentration. But still, you can see the decline in NO2 in the most state that we can go with my team. And this is the PN2.5 comparison. As you can see, in Texas, uh, we didn't see uh, that much difference in terms of the CN205 concentration, uh, primarily because the CN205 in Texas is not a regional, uh, uh, it doesn't have a regional source. Uh, it's mostly uh, it's due to the transport. But for other states that uh, the CN205 has a regional uh, uh, reason uh, we saw the decrease in P25 with the COVID-19. And even the California we saw in the beginning of the COVID-19 and uh, until the uh, August, we saw the decline in P25, but after the fire season starts in uh, September and October, we saw a huge uh, increase in P25. If you continue this uh, plot by today, uh, that would be over here or 60 microgram per cubic meter, which is a five or six times of this, uh, the uh, normal value. And uh, the, the interesting thing about this part of the United States is that in Oregon, Idaho, Montana, uh, Washington, uh, Wyoming, you can see the spike in uh, PN25 due to the uh, wildfire season. Uh, but for I Idaho, it was it's normal. Uh, so the, uh, in 2020, it's completely normalized. But in Nevada, California, it's, uh, it's a different story. So the 2020 is a completely new year uh, compared with the historical level. Uh, to sum up, I just want to mention this. In, uh, in 2020, in uh, the COVID-19 time period, we didn't see that much difference in terms of the total VOC. Uh, uh, in ambient air quality. It means uh, it's uh, primarily due to that the industry didn't shut down during that time period. But we saw significant decrease in NO2 and uh, BTEX, which are the uh, footprint of the mobile sources. With not decreasing VOC and decreasing the, uh, the NO2 and BTEX, uh, we can see an interesting thing that happened during the COVID-19 and after. Uh, as Mustafa mentioned, during the first weeks of COVID-19, which knocks uh, a value of BOC also, uh, they think significantly uh, that it, uh, compared with the historical level, 46% uh, for NAX and uh, almost 10% for BOC, we saw a significant decline in ozone concentration, about 20%. But as the time progressed and the uh, industry opens, so we saw uh, the VOC back to the normal level. And uh, as the traffic traffic goes up, uh, we saw the NOx uh, uh, is back into the normal level. Uh, 
This leads to a, 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 a nonlinear chemistry that ozone has. So when you have a significant reduction in max on VOC, you'll get the ozone reduction. But uh, if you don't have the significant reduction in max concentration and uh, VOC is unchanged, the ozone concentration actually will increase. Uh, this is due, uh, primarily due to that we live in a uh, NOx uh, limited VOC sensitive region. It means that uh, the ozone concentration, uh, the uh, formation of ozone concentration is uh, due to the availability of the NOx. So if we have less NOx available to kill ozone, we'll get more ozone to be formed. So that's exactly what we saw uh, here in this time period. So it's a little bit less Max and with uh, BOC unchanged, we saw a 10% increase in ozone concentration. So this is a very good uh, conclusion of what COVID-19 does uh, to our city. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, we're here to answer any question you might have. All right, thank you for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Beydoun and Dr. Islami. Um, we're now gonna uh, have some questions answered on the floor. And some people have already started sending some in. So the first one is uh, from Rajan. He says uh, that for a long time, the argument has been made that much of the bad air quality in Houston was due to off-road vehicles. How do the conclusions get impacted uh, by off-road vehicles? I can start that off and then maybe have Ibrahim chime in. Uh, off-road vehicles, are a contributor to some of our bad air quality. They're a significant contributor in many areas to, to our uh, PM emissions. But, but, but given the scale of our on-road transportation sector, uh, both light-duty passenger cars, including SUVs and, and heavy-duty transport vehicles, everything from delivery trucks to the big 18-wheelers, you know, th that still represents a much more significant portion of, of our overall emissions. And, and one of the things kind of what COVID showed us is if you do improve the air quality on the uh, transportation side. And, and that can be everything from keeping people at home because uh, of, of, of orders at, at the state or local level, or if you electrify, uh, you know, th that segment of the transportation sector, they buy, thereby dramatically reducing NOx emissions, you end up with improved air quality. And we saw that in that first three or four uh, week period of COVID where, where the, 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 the NOx numbers dropped dramatically and VOC dropped as well. And and, and ozone dropped almost 20% in our area. And in Dallas, I think it hit over 20%. Uh, the critical issue to keep in mind, and this is something Ibrahim touched on at the end, is if you have smaller uh, NOx reductions, you end up actually increasing ozone levels if you don't have a corresponding decrease in VOC emissions. Uh, and, 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 and there maybe you have some policies that look at on-road, off-road uh, uh, together and, and, and don't just focus on NOx, but also focus on also uh, finding ways to, uh, to simultaneously also reduce VOC emissions. So you don't, you don't end up in, in a weird situation where you're improving air quality by reducing NOx, but uh, to a certain degree, uh, lower uh, NO2 uh, concentrations in the air, but ironically uh, degrading our ozone levels by, by increasing ozone formation because of the photochemistry associated with the issue. But, but, but yeah, Houston's a complicated uh, place for air quality. On-road is very important, and off-road really is, but, 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 it, but in our area, just given the sheer scale of the, uh, the on-road sector, it really does overshadow for the most part, with the exception of some PM emissions, the contribution uh, to, to our bad air quality uh, as compared to the off-road sector. Did you want to add anything, uh, Ibrahim? I just want to add, uh, that's, that was a very good explanation. I just want to add one thing. Uh, per vehicle or per mile travel, yes, off-road vehicles are emitting uh, a lot more than uh, on-road vehicles. But uh, as Monsanto mentioned, they are contrib contributing a little bit, but not as much as the uh, on-road vehicles, it's just, uh, at least in most parts of the region. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is from Dr. Krishnamurthy. Um, he says, if wind is such an important contributor to the washing out of the PM 2.5 in Corpus Christi, how come the absolute concentration is comparable to that in Austin? And can you also explain what other factors might be important in quantifying PM 2.5? 
Kagil, uh, I will ask this question. Yes. Uh, actually, the, the, first of all, the, I think washing gas was in uh, 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 in El Paso. Uh, we saw a significant decrease in CO2 due to the higher wind uh, on the region. Uh, the Corpus Christi, I think it was, uh, it didn't change that much. We didn't see that much difference in Corpus Christi. Uh, but uh, the thing that is, uh, Actually, it's a lot of the study is being done right now to identify the contribution and the source for the apportionment of the pm 5 in the Texas. Uh, many of them, uh, they believe that the, the large portion of the pm 5 emission comes coming out, coming from outside the state. So when you have a higher than a normal uh, or higher than usual uh, wind, uh, uh, wind condition, the more the more uh, pm 5 coming in, in, the, in the region. Actually, that's what we saw in, uh, in the, during COVID-19. The COVID-19 was the case uh, with the higher wind wind speed and uh, even higher wind speed in El Paso. So the El Paso, uh, the, the, the emission washed out of El Paso and uh, was brought into the state. So that's why in El Paso we saw a significant decrease. And in Austin, which is the next city to El Paso, basically, Geographically, we saw the uh, highest increase. So it means that a portion of the the to fire which was washed in El Paso brought to the Austin air, and we saw uh, a, a less a decrease in uh, Corpus Christi compared with the Houston. Uh, they they share a lot of meteorological conditions in these two cities. And so that's actually another uh, way to look at. So in the southern region of the United States, uh, the, the southern re region of the state. Uh, we saw higher wind, and in the northern part we saw uh, 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 we saw higher TN25. So that was uh, another evidence to that uh, TN25 uh, was brought to the region. And this is just the case during the, the uh, cold month. So this is completely different during the warm month. During the warm month, for example, right now uh, the TN25 is coming out of the, the different sources. So it's a little bit more complicated month by month and changed much month by month. But that the data that we showed here uh, was the observation that we, we observed during the COVID-19 time specifically. So that the conclusion would, would be different if we uh, uh, study uh, during the summer, for example. Yeah, and, and the stronger the normal winds kind of exacerbated our poor PM numbers by by facilitating that that, that external uh, PM transport from, we, we suspect maybe some, some of the agricultural fires that we all saw going on in, in Mexico in, in, in March and April and, and brought it to our region. Uh, and, and, and that's why after a lot of those fires died out in, in April, our PM numbers went essentially back to normal, so to speak. All right. And then a follow-up question to that one uh, is, have there been any similar studies done in China or South Korea to correlate air quality with uh, mobility? And if so, how do your assessments uh, uh, agree with those studies? Yeah, I, I, you know, there's been quite a few studies uh, across Europe, uh, across uh, Asia, and, 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 and certainly across the U.S. And, and, and you see those wonderful pictures of the Los Angeles skyline and, and, and mountains where, where, where kids uh, in March and April saw what they hadn't seen for much of their life because of the fact that air quality dramatically includes, improved, I'm sorry, uh, at the uh, beginning of the uh, COVID pandemic because of the stay-at-home orders and, and substantially diminished uh, transportation activity. And in an area like California where a lot more of their emissions are from transportation than even here in, in our region, that was really pretty dramatic. Uh, Ibrahim, did you want to mention some of the research that uh, some of our colleagues at UH are doing? In, in Asia? Yeah. Yeah, actually, the, the actually in UH, in the, in, uh, my my advisor, the, the Detroit, uh, he he's done a very good job on analyzing how uh, using remote sensing data how uh, the, the air quality has changed during the uh, COVID-19. The short term, it's a short term analysis, and they showed that uh, in uh, because of the, the strict lockdown like, uh, policies uh, uh, and the significant reduction in uh, traffic emissions, the NO2 and uh, decrease significantly. And for those regions, the, the decrease in NO2 uh, significant decrease in NO2 concentration leads to the even more significant decrease in TN25 because the, the, the atmosphere, the TN25 are very related to the uh, NO2, particularly in, in, in China and uh, uh, for South Korea. But in United States also, uh, we have some studies that 
uh, analyze the short-term effects of the COVID-19 due to the decreasing mobility. And I saw a very good uh, study that I think the Harvard uh, folks did that. That, that. that was that was I liked because they also uh, they calculate the, the health impact of such uh, decrease as well. But yes, uh, our finding was in line with the finding of other colleagues in the United States and across the world. And, and there, there was quite a few studies also in India, and a lot of those you'd see kind of before and after pictures. In our region, there's some of that, but, but there it was quite stark where, where in, in, the, in the normal quote-unquote before pictures, you know, you could barely make out the skyline of the city or, or, or the terrain behind it, where, whereas during those first uh, month or two of the COVID pandemic, because of the restriction, you know, you could clearly see what was, what was in, in that picture as compared to, you know, during normal times, mainly because of the significant improvement in air quality. Uh, especially with respect to, to PM and, and NOx and, and ozone, of course. So we have a question from Stephanie. Uh, she's asking if decreasing the nitric oxide by a small amount leads to an increase in ozone concentration. What do you think are policy implications of this, especially when thinking about increasing EV adoption? Is there any way to avoid unintended consequence? And should there be a significant increase in fuel economy standards after a certain point? Well, I mean, and, and that's a good question, and that, that was one of, kind of, I think, the inherent policy implications of our research. It showed that if you have a significant decrease in NOx emissions, i.e. a significant penetration in terms of electrical ve electric vehicles over a short period of time, then you get those resulting, uh, certainly uh, NOx and O2 reductions, but of course the ozone reductions, which, are, which is really our biggest problem in the region. Uh, what, what the research showed essentially is, is small kind of incremental piecemeal NOx reductions once again, while they're good for NO2, they're, they're, they're bad for ozone. And I think w what that necessitates is also to, to focus on, on other policies where you're also reducing VOCs, uh, looking at area sources, looking at maybe other transportation sources for reductions, and, and of course, looking at industry in terms of further reducing uh, VOC emissions. And that way, you're reducing NOx and VOCs in tandem, and you don't end up uh, – solving one problem, but, but, but exacerbating our worst problem, which is ozone. And, you know, over time, it, it, these things will be self-corrected, of course, because you're reducing NOx so far, but, 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 but in terms of that incremental uh, way moving forward, uh, you really do need to look at, at VOC reductions along the way if, if you're looking to aggressively electrify and, uh, and do it over a longer period of time, so to speak. Uh, if you're interested, in, once again, primarily in ozone issues. And, uh, anything else, Ibrahim, that, that I might have missed there in terms of kind of that nexus between NOx and VOCs and, and kind of our unique photochemistry here in the region? I just want to mention one more time that uh, uh, Houston is generally uh, not saturated in the VOC sensitive region. It means that they have a ratio called VOC over NOx ratio. So because uh, most of the emissions in, in the, the city comes from NOx rather than the VOC, that the NOx is mostly contributing to the emission. That's, that's what I mean. So the, it means that the uh, formation of ozone is very sensitive to the VOC rather than, than NOx. In that case, when we, ha when we get uh, less NOx, it means that the rate of the formation of ozone actually increases. Uh, in terms of if we, uh, in, if we in decrease the NOx by like 10, 20 percent, the rate of the uh, uh, ozone formation increase, basically. Unless we touch the VOC as well, and that, uh, that ratio decreases uh, alongside each other. So in that case, we can uh, uh, decrease the rate of uh, ozone formation. So that's what uh, we have here. And uh, that, uh, that was the case for the last 30 years in uh, Houston. And I just want to point out that, uh, uh, that one, this is one of the reasons that uh, since 2014, 15, 16, uh, we didn't, we don't see any decrease in uh, ozone concentration in the city. We had a very good run in last 20 years since 2000, but uh, that, that very good run in ozone decrease stopped basically in 2014, 15, 16. So the ozone concentration in the region is stagnant. Even though the NOx concentration decreased, that's actually the reason behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and once again, not every city or not every region has a similar uh, NOx limited VOC sensitive kind of photochemical chemistry going behind, working behind the scenes. It really depends on the area and the region. 
and, and the, the part of the country we're talking about. It's just that in Houston, that's the phenomena that we have to make sure policy addresses and looks at when it's looking at, at everything from uh, vehicle electrification policies to, 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 to other NOx reduction strategies that don't necessarily also, uh, or, or let's say are not necessarily accompanied by a corresponding VOC reduction to maintain that ratio that uh, Brahim was talking about. Actually, there's a, there's a U.S. study that also the Detroit uh, was the lead on. Uh, they, uh, they, they analyzed different scenarios of, of electrification. So, and they found that the light uh, electrification uh, was contributing to increasing the ozone concentration. And if you, if you want to get the ozone concentration decreased due to electrification, we have to be more aggressive in terms of the electrification. And that's actually a very good study that they, they analyze different scenarios of electrification, for this, particularly for the Houston area. Yeah, and that's what we saw in our research when you look at air quality in, in March and April versus June, where you kind of saw that exact study basically manifesting itself on the ground at Houston. All right, and then I have two questions from Ralph. It says, um, how do you anticipate that EVs will impact air quality in Houston if we assume that Houston's transportation has 10% EVs by 2030 and 50% by 2040? What impact would that have? Well, I think the 50% would clearly have a positive impact uh, overall across the board. And, and I think, uh, once again, that'll mirror some of the results we saw in, in, in that early COVID uh, period with, with the more strict shutdowns and the almost 50% reductions in NOx and significant VOC reductions as well. The, that other scenario, once again, mimics kind of what we saw towards the end, where, where you had, you know, 10, 15% reductions in NOx, but actually increases in, uh, in ozone, once again, mainly because of the photochemistry in our region. So, so uh, it, you know, during, once again, that initial uh, period, uh, as we transition and, and adopt more and more EVs uh, across the board, like passenger vehicles, SUVs, and and hopefully heavy duty vehicles as well, it does become important to, to look at a couple of things, where the power from those EVs is coming from and whether that results in, in VOC reductions and, and, and NOx reductions on the ground. And, 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 and you know, once again, being cognizant of the fact that we need to uh, come up with, with VOC reductions uh, to, 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 to keep that ratio as consistent as possible, especially during those initial periods when, when those uh, uh, penetration scenarios aren't as aggressive. You know, if, 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 if in 2040 it's 50% EVs and, and they're primarily being powered by West Texas wind and, and, and Houston area solar, then it's a clear benefit in terms of, uh, of our air quality and our shed, uh, and our air shed, uh, literally across the board. And then the, the second question tied along with that was, uh, does the ship in air traffic contribute significantly to air quality? And if so, what percentage or what fraction of it does? Yeah, yes. Uh, you know, the, one of the fastest growing sectors of, of, of emissions is, uh, is is large vessel marine traffic. Is, was that the question? Uh, are we talking about marine vessels or, or, or airplanes here? Or both? Uh, both. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so that was what, that's one of the fastest growing sectors of emissions globally, uh, given how uh, interconnected transportation systems have become. Uh, there's been a lot of recent regulations it's difficult to regulate these vessels, of course, because they're primarily journeying uh, and, and making their way from one area of the world to the other in international waters. But, but the International Maritime Organization and some of these other groups have started looking at, at, at uh, more traditional emission standards. And, and you know, for example, in, in many parts of the U.S. now, you can't use bunker fuel when you're within you know, 15 nautical miles of the U.S. coast and so on. So, so they've historically been a problem mainly because of how fast they're growing. In a region like ours, they've, they've generally always been a problem, not as much as maybe the traditional transportation sector, but, but, but you know, we have a 50 plus mile, uh, uh, you know, ship channel that literally cuts through the heart of Houston. And there's significant traffic uh, going in and out in both directions, given that we have the second largest uh, port in terms of tonnage in the country. And you have all those massive industrial facilities up and down the coast. Uh, so, th so there's still a significant source of, of pollution, and uh, there are concerns, but, but, but they are getting cleaner. Uh, uh, and and as, as, as the ship channel is widened and deepened, newer, cleaner vessels will be able to access uh, the, the various points of, 
you know, of, of drop off and pick up up and down the ship channel, with, which means, you know, on a per unit uh, uh, of, of, of cargo that, that, that you're uh, bringing in or out, uh, your emissions will certainly be significantly lower. And, and there's even electrified uh, dredging equipment and tugs and other things that are making their way online now. Now, in, in terms of uh, the airplanes, do you, have, do you have some numbers off of that, off, offhand, Ibrahim? It's a concern, but it's certainly not as big of a concern, at least at the ground level, as, as, as I think traditional transportation, both on road and off road. Actually, there are some concerns in the neighbor, neighborhood of the airport in, because uh, we're, yeah. we're operating two of the largest airports in the country, so the IAs and Hobby. So in the neighborhood, actually, uh, I saw some studies, uh, both experimental and research, studies, that they found some uh, increased number due to the airport emissions. Uh, but uh, in, in, when we look at the big picture, the, the, the whole city uh, or the whole county, uh, they are not contributing that much compared with uh, actually what, what the cars have for the mobile sources and even the industry. But there are something uh, in the neighborhood of the airport, of, of course. Yeah, and, and with the vessels, again, you know, they're a big concern from a PM perspective more so than a, a, a VOC perspective. And, and, and that, that's why, you know, to Ibrahim's point, it's more of a localized problem up and down the ship channel rather than a broader regional problem as, as we have with transportation and the industry with respect to, to ozone attainment. But then that's the beauty of air quality in Houston. If you look at it that way, they're, they're, you know, we have air pollution coming from everywhere. Los Angeles, Atlanta, some of these other major U.S. cities, it's primarily, you know, traditional on-road transportation with, with some marine. In Houston, it's take your pick. You have, you have some of the largest traditional transportation infrastructure in the country. You have massive marine facilities. You have two major airports. You have the biggest industrial base of really any major metropolitan area, heavy kind of basic petrochemical industry. And, uh, and, and then, as we discussed earlier, you have... You have transboundary transport from Mexico and other parts of the U.S. and other parts of the state coming in and out of our region. So, so, so when you look at air quality in Houston, you get to deal with it all. But, but at the end of the day, we've made some significant progress, uh, to Brahim's point, since the late 1990s and certainly early 2000s. And while it's stagnated for, for the last few years, I think we're all optimistic with long-term electrification scenarios and continuous improvement on the industrial side. Uh, and, and once again, even on the off-road side and, and the marine side, that we're, we'll hopefully continue once again to, to see some more significant improvements, as we did in the early two, uh, 2000s with respect to our, our ambient air quality. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Beydoun and uh, Dr. Eslami, we're running out of time. Uh, do you guys have any further remarks um, that you guys would like to say? Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I, I think we shared our email addresses. Please, if you have any questions or would like to reach out to us about anything or, or have some ideas, uh, feel free to contact us. And we'd be more than happy to talk to you about whatever it is that you'd like to talk about. So, so, so thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, no, thank, uh, like, thank you for being here. So we appreciate it. And on yeah. November... Sorry. <laughs> On November um, 19th, we're having another webinar with Dr. Erin Laska uh, from U of H. She's going to be talking about electrification of um, high transit vehicles as well as um, just regular electric vehicles. So hope, we hope to see you guys on uh, November 19th. And once again, thank you to our partner for Evolve Houston. Um, we were glad to have them. And, uh, thank you so much for uh, hosting this, uh, Mustafa, and uh, um, really appreciate you and Dr. Slami coming on this and uh, sharing your insights. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. We'll see you back on November 19th here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day, everyone.